All right, so now that we've discussed contact forces, in this video, we're gonna talk about non-contact forces, and then we're going to do an example problem where we get to apply a number of physics concepts that we've discussed in previous videos. So, as we know, contact forces are forces that require direct contact to occur. It should not be a surprise then that non-contact forces are forces that do not require direct contact to occur. There are a number of different types of non-contact forces. The one we're gonna focus on in this video is gravitational force. As you know, if you throw an object up into the air, it's going to fall down because it's experiencing the force of gravity. And of course, in that situation, when your ball's in the air and it's experiencing gravity, it's not in direct contact with anything. Hence, non-contact force. So, what is the gravitational force? Well, we can see here by definition, it's an attractive force between objects of masses, right? And it's between all masses, which means, you know, I have a mass, this marker I'm holding has a mass, this whiteboard has a mass. And it's an attractive force as well. However, you don't see this marker just, uh, you know, moving towards me by itself. You also don't see myself gravitating towards this whiteboard, you know, without anything going on. And it's not that there isn't a gravitational force between all of these masses that I just described. There are gravitational forces. However, these forces are so weak that they're negligible. They're so weak that we can't even perceive them. And we can explain this by looking at the equation for the gravitational force, which is F of G equals GMM over R squared. In this equation, we have G, which is a constant. This is actually a very, very small constant. And it's actually this constant which makes most gravitational forces negligible. Because you have a small constant, the only way you can get an appreciable gravitational force is if you're dealing with objects of substantial mass. So the two m's here are referring to the two masses interacting with each other. So you have to be working with objects of very large masses to be getting an appreciable gravitational force. So for instance, here on the Earth, often when we talk about the gravitational force experienced by objects, we're talking about the gravitational force exerted by the Earth on different objects. And that works because the Earth has a very large mass, so it can produce appreciable gravitational forces. The last component in this equation is r, which is simply the distance between the masses. And this equation, you might have seen it before in a physics class, but you probably also recall seeing a much simpler equation, which we've got right here, f of g equals mg. This equation we use to describe the weight of an object. But you can really see that the weight of an object is really just the gravitational force that it experiences. And here, m would be the mass of the object you're referring to. And g, we know we typically plug in our 9.8 meters per second squared. So why do we have this simpler equation and this more complex one? Well, they're actually describing the same exact equation. The only difference is that in this case, the lowercase g has been used to substitute for multiple terms, capital G, capital M over R squared. And as it turns out, if you were to plug in the universal gravitational constant, that small constant I was referring to, the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, you would get a value of approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. So an important thing to keep in mind here is that when we're calculating the weight of an object using mg, you can really only use the 9.8 meters per second squared when you're looking at the weight of the object on Earth. If you're in outer space or if you're on another planet, you cannot use f of g equals mg with g as 9.8. You would have to calculate a new value for g. Okay. So now that we better understand non-contact forces with our example of gravitational force or weight, let's take a look at an example where we can apply concepts of contact forces and non-contact forces. So in this case, 
we have an example where a person pushes a box with a mass of 20 kilograms to the right with a force of 20 newtons to the right. If the box does not move and the coefficient of static friction is 0.3, what is the force of static friction? So this is a typical physics situation. You have an object and forces going on. In these types of problems, the best thing to do at first is to draw out the situation. So we know that we have a box with a mass of 20 kilograms. We also have a person that is pushing this box. And if they're pushing a box, that means they're exerting an applied force. And they tell us that this applied force is 20 newtons. Now, in our free body diagram, we need to include all the forces. So we know it's not just the applied force. We certainly also have the force of static friction, which is actually what we want to solve for in this question. We also have the normal force, which is perpendicular to the surface. And we have the weight of the object, force of gravity. Now, as you recall, when you're dealing with forces in different directions, it's often helpful to separate the forces in perpendicular components. Often, the question is only asking about one of the two directions. And in that case, you don't have to deal with all the forces. In fact, in this case, we want to solve for the force of static friction. So that means we can really just focus on the forces in the horizontal direction. So if we go ahead and do that, in the horizontal direction, we've got two forces. We've got the force applied, and we've got the force of static friction. One thing you want to consider is, what is the net force going to be? Is there a net force, or is the net force equal to zero? And in this question, they tell us the box does not move. So the box does not move, your box is at rest. And if it's at rest, that means certainly that the net force in the horizontal direction has to be equal to zero. So if it's equal to zero, that means the force applied minus the force of static friction has to equal zero, which actually tells us that the force applied is equal to the force of static friction and since the force applied is equal to 20 newtons, that means the force of static friction is also equal to 20 newtons. And this makes sense because our object is not moving, so that means the net force has to be zero, and it would make sense for the net force to be zero if they're both 20 newtons but in opposite directions. All right. Now, some of you might be thinking, hey, I thought the equation for force of static friction was mu sub s times the normal force. That's correct. But that quantity would be used to solve for, would be used to answer a different question. All right, so that type of question would be asking something along the lines of, you know, continuing the problem, how much force is necessary to move the box. So in this situation, we know that the person pushed with a force of 10 newtons. That clearly wasn't enough. So they start pushing with more force, 15 newtons, 20 newtons, 25 newtons. At some point, they should be able to apply enough force that the object starts to move. And what this is solving for is the maximum force of static friction. Right? Because, you know, as you push, static friction is going to do everything it can to prevent motion. However, at some point, once you've applied a force that exceeds the maximum force of static friction, the object is going to start to move. So essentially, what we mean by this is, you recall our equation for static friction is F of S is less than or equal to mu sub S times the normal force. What this expression also tells us is the maximum force of static friction is equal to mu sub s times the normal force. All right, this is the maximum force that needs to be exerted. So let's try to calculate this value. Now, the normal force is in the vertical direction. So now we have to consider the net force in the vertical direction. 
And in this situation, our box is on the surface. It's not flying into the air. It's not crashing through the ground. So again, the net force in the vertical direction is going to equal zero. So we know we have normal force pointing up minus the weight of the object pointing down is equal to zero, which tells us the normal force is equal to the weight of the object, which we know is mg. We can plug that in over here, that the maximum force of static friction is equal to mu sub s times mg, and we know that mu sub s is given to us as 0 0.3, the mass of the object is 20 kilograms, gravity we know is 9.8, but for calculations on the MCAT, 10 is fine. So then you've got 0.3 times 20 times 10. So 0.3 times 10 is gonna give us three. Three times 20 is going to give us 60 Newtons. So this is actually the answer here. The maximum force of static friction is 60 Newtons. So what that means is as long as the person applies a force of less than 60 newtons, the object is not going to move. But if the person applies a force greater than 60 newtons, the object is going to start to move. So below this value, it doesn't mean that the static friction, so, so what I mean by that is, if the person applies a force less than 60 newtons, in this case, they applied a force of 20 newtons, it doesn't mean that friction is going to be 60 newtons. Again, friction is only as large as it needs to be to prevent motion. So if you push with the force of 20 newtons, friction is going to be 20 newtons. If you push with a force of 30 newtons, friction is going to be 30 newtons. So that's why this equation applies, that friction is less than or equal to its maximum value, which in this case we calculated as 60 newtons.